Get the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. If you're Frank and Mary, once again, you're, and you're in that asset situation, um, and you need those amounts to live, $84,000, and you've got that income and you're getting that VA benefit because Frank is getting the benefit, that means the burn rate has turned into only $24,000. And that once again assumes that Frank and Mary are keeping their house. And by the way, if you're a better, if you move to an assisted living facility and you're getting the benefit, you can keep your house uh, even though, it, 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 and it will still be called your home. The VA, when they're calculating your assets, don't include the value of your house. But you can keep it as long as you're not renting it out, as long as you've got friends or whatever living there and the value of it will not be counted no matter what the equity in the home. So at using this scenario, the burn rate for Frank and Mary is only $24,000 a year, which means they could stay in assisted living for 12.5 years. Now, so let's, let's talk about one other, one other possibility here. So say that Frank and Mary have got this house and they decide that they're gonna borrow against the house because remember the house was worth, we were estimating $600,000. So suppose Frank and Mary simply went out and in addition to their other assets decided, I'm gonna take an equity loan on this house, right? I'm gonna take an equity loan of $300,000 on the house. Now, if they take that equity loan, then the amount of cash that they have available in order to deal with paying for the assisted living facility has now gone way up, right? Obviously, they've gotta make monthly payments on the equity loan, but, the, but those monthly payments are tiny now. The interest rates on these equity loans are 2%, 3%. So suddenly now, you, Frank and Mary have got that same income, 36,000. They've got that VA, that VA benefit of 24,000. Um, they've got this burn rate to deal with. Uh, but suddenly, um, when they're trying to deal with that burn rate, if they've got $650,000 instead of $300,000, the money lasts for 25 years. So now, Frank and Mary can be pretty safe in thinking they're gonna be able to stay in assisted living as long as they want. Um, and then there's the tax code. And once again, there's a lot of math here, but just kind of, just, just think of, try to see the kind of broad concepts that we're trying to talk about. Then there's the tax code. The interesting thing about needing assistance with two of the activities of daily living is that not only are you entitled to the veteran's benefit, but once again, if your payments are, are, cl are clustered, if there is one bill that you're paying to the assisted living facility for everything, including the assistance with the activities of daily living, uh, and that is certified by a healthcare professional, does not have to be your doctor, needs to be a healthcare professional, then as far as the IRS is concerned, and the local Department of Revenue follows the IRS rules, the payment, the monthly payment for assisted living becomes a medical deduction, becomes a medical deduction. Now why would Frank and Mary care though about that? Because they don't have a lot of income, right? They've only got, they got their social security and Frank's pension, so they don't need a medical deduction. They're probably not paying any taxes. But what if they decided to take their money, say, say, that, say the 300,000 or $600,000 and give it to their son, Peter, now? Of course, this strategy requires that you really get along with Peter, right? And that you trust Peter. But if you were to do that, if, you were, if Frank and Mary were to give their money to Peter, uh, and Peter were to then pay the assisted living bill every month, as long as Peter's contribution to Frank and Mary equals more than 50% of all the money that Frank and Mary are living on, which would clearly be the case here, if Peter were paying for all of the assisted living bill, then that medical deduction becomes his medical deduction. He can write it off. Now, if he's in New York City, and I'm assuming that he's making good money, I told you, he's a lawyer, so he's gotta be making, he's gotta be making big money. 
His federal rate is probably 33%. His New York state rate is 6.65%. Um, but by the way, and that's combined the New York state rate and the New York City rate. If you can believe it, New York City has its own income tax. Which means he's got a total tax rate of 40%. So con translating that into this deduction, if he pays $100,000 to the assisted living facility for his parents, as a result of that, he is probably going to be entitled to a $40,000 tax deduction or a reduction, not, a, not just a deduction, but a re actual reduction in the amount that he's going to pay in federal, state, and New York City taxes. He's going to get $40,000 that he would have paid to those three entities that he's going to get to keep. Now, if, Fr if Peter decides that instead of just keeping that money, He's going to be a nice son, and he's going to use that money to help his parents, Frank and Mary, since that's the reason why he got the, the deduction. The result of that is that he is going to extend the, the, the value of that money, the 300000 or the 600000 by 40%. Because, it, because for every $100,000 he pays here, he's going to get $40,000 back that he's going to be able to get to use again. So once again, for, depend, for, for income, for tax purposes, the dependency rule is Frank, or Peter has to be providing more than 50% of all the support to Frank and Mary. Uh, if Frank and Mary's income is $3,000, that's $36,000 a year. Dep dependency is going to mean that Peter is paying more than $36,000 a year on behalf of Frank and Mary. His tax savings on $600,000, which means over several years, at 40%, remember, he's getting 40% of that money he's getting to keep because it's money that he otherwise would have paid to the IRS, the state of New York, and New York City. For that $600,000, he gets to keep $240,000. If he throws that into the same pot where Frank and Mary had their $600,000, the pot is now $840,000. Once again, assisted living is $72,000, the extras are twelve. dollars the total is $84,000. If Frank and Mary's income is 36 and the burn rate is $48,000, that $840,000 will allow Frank and Mary to stay here or to stay someplace for 17.5 years. So the bottom line is there are a whole set of strategies that Frank and Mary can use to finance, the, to finance their assisted living. The question that they want to ask themselves always at the beginning, and I think that's really where it was so helpful to hear from, from both Jan and, Ma Jan and Mar Marianne yeah. and Marilyn. I'm bad on names. I'm getting old. I'm getting old. You really want to start off by figuring out, is this the right place? But then, once you figure that out, rather than saying, boy, it's really beautiful, but I just can't afford it, go do the math. Go do the math and figure it out. If you're Frank and Mary, in many of these situations, you can afford to be here. And if being here means that you're safer, and it means that for social purposes, you're, you're more socialized, then that's really the answer. Now, I'm just going to kind of close with just one thing. One of the things that I have come to appreciate since watching all of this play out with my mother, I had always thought, or for many years I thought, that when you're dealing with dementia, that there are a set of symptoms that you know are dementia symptoms. There's like loss of memory. And then when there's serious loss of memory, there's inability to do things that requires some memory, like brushing your teeth, actually, takes a whole, remembering a whole step, set of steps, you know, or dressing yourself, or doing a lot of things. So there are, there are these, these cognitively related symptoms. And then there are these other symptoms. There's the aggression that you see in folks who have got dementia, or the apathy, or the tremendous depression, um, or the anxiety about being near people and stuff. I have come to appreciate over time that those symptoms are simply secondary symptoms. Those are not necessary symptoms of dementia. They are symptoms caused by the people themselves reacting to the fact they have dementia and reacting to the people who are around them. And so people can avoid those symptoms. And, and it's really those symptoms which are the really bad part about the dementia. Because as, as I was talking to my wife about this, I said, you know, She's a New York Times crossword puzzle people, per person. I said, you know, I really don't need to know that when I'm 90 I can do the New York Times crossword puzzle. I'd like to know that, I be, that I'm happy 
and that I'm talking to people and that I'm having a kind of a satisfying day. And if you are with people who are really trained in understanding what dementia is, you can have all those things. For Frank and Mary, they may not be able to get that at home because the average person doesn't have that kind of training. The nice thing about the memory care units in many of these assisted living facilities is you have people who do. So the result is you can live a life, you may not be able to do the Times Crossword puzzle, but you can live a life that is happy and that feels fulfilled. Thank you very much. Any questions? Any questions? If not, thank you. Um, if you want to see this again, uh, all of the programs that I do, I upload into my YouTube channel. Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel, Elder Law Frank and Mary. And the goal of all of this work is always to sleep well at night. So this may be completely irrelevant to you, to your parents, to whoever. If it's not, though, if you're worried about this stuff, you ought to look at these alternatives. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.